Our next speaker is Alistair Thompson, who's head of Scoop Media, which is the largest independent news platform in New Zealand. And he's faced some challenges and changing his ownership model. So welcome, Alistair. G'day everybody. It's nice to be back. I was here some time ago, um, 2002 actually, um, talking about um, the, the role of the media in the second, second Gulf War. And it was just in the sort of few months after the war started. And um, I was talking about the misinformation campaigns that led up to the war. And um, it was one of, I mean, it was a great, it was a, I really enjoyed, um, it was a sort of like a lunchtime speaker series or something. Um, and it turned into a really nice, nice article, which is one of my best pieces of work. Um, so I'm, I feel very comfortable here. And if you want to follow me these days, I do most of my journalism on Twitter. The, um, the, world, of, the world of media is changing very rapidly. Um, but I mean, I'll just give you a little bit of background about my own, my own role in the media. I was a print journalist originally. Um, and I started out in the Dominion newspaper at the age of 20 um, and spent a decade in printed newspapers and magazines from the mid and through to the mid-1990s. Um, and it was already pretty apparent there that the, that the writing was on the wall for journalism as a profession, even like by 95. So I decided at that point I might study law instead. And studied law up until 1999 and then um, some things happened which made, made me stop studying law and setting up, and I set up Scoop. Um, and Scoop, you probably, I mean, does every, has everybody here seen Scoop? Yes. Um, so I probably don't need to explain what we do, but there might be, there's a little aspect of it which I think is probably worth understanding. So our, our approach to, to sort of curating the news is, is quite deliberate. Um, and um, I really enjoyed the remarks of um, Dr. Longhurst earlier where he's talking about the sort of the, um, the philosophical basis um, to this discussion and the theological basis to this discussion and the role of truth and, and of secrecy. So our approach to information has always been to, um, to pursue truth. I mean, that's the natural um, objective of journalism, I suppose, um, but also op to oppose secrecy. So we've always attempted to try and tell those stories which are not being told, um, to, to illuminate that which is being withheld from the public, to, to talk about the people in West Papua, to talk about the, um, the conflict in Gaza and the stories of the people in Gaza and so forth. Um, in the early days to talk about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, in the lead up to the Gulf War to talk about the lies that were already being told. There was, there was, there was very widespread reporting on the lies that were being told in the lead up to the war before it started. Um, so there's that. Now, when we so when we pro we process material on Scoop, we make we triage it, we filter it, and we decide whether or not it's 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 irrelevant. And we tag it and we source it and we publish it in its entirety with its metadata, so that if, so that when you see a piece of information on Scoop, it's actionable. You know what its source is. You know where it came from. By comparison with that, news, news information which is published on the web these days is not that reliable. You can't tell where it came from. You, can't, you, can, you can search for phrases and attempt to try to figure out what the source of the information is, but it's almost impossible to have any degree of reliability that it's actually accurate. Um, I noticed just the other day in the reporting of um, the TPP in the TV3 news report at the beginning of the bulletin, in the voiceover, um, the person said that um, the government was going to save $247 million in tariffs, which is just nonsense. So, um, and I mean, that was obviously in the script. It had got through, through, the, through, the, through the people. So, I mean, it's a, there's, a prob there's problems there in terms of the standards of the media. Um, so, the remarks about the surveillance society... I personally have been felt intimidated as a journalist as soon as I realised how widespread this was. Um, and when we saw Andrea Vance, um, the Andrea Vance GCSB Kitteridge report inquiry, it became apparent that a minister can get sacked for having a conversation with a reporter and for that being obvious via metadata alone. 
So he was convicted and lost his ministerial position purely out of metadata. And he was a minister, so he's, it's about as high as you can get in terms of authority. I'd also very strongly endorse um, Valerie's suggestion that the only sensible response in these circumstances is some form of collective action, because the power imbalance and the power asymmetry, asymmetry and information asymmetry that, we, that we're experiencing can only be addressed through collective action. So um, tonight here there's a bunch of people that um, I like a great deal, including Jan, who's over there, who's been a great supporter of Scoop for several years, and, um, and, and especially in the last sort of nine months or so. Um, and my mother, Margaret, who's the other trustee of the Scoop Foundation, um, and my wife, Wendy, and we've, today we sold our house. <laughs> so we're feeling really quite pleased with ourselves, which is partly why this speech is somewhat impromptu. Um, so today we launched this. So we launched a campaign to help establish a solution to the news crisis. Um, so we've been doing this for like nine months or so, but we've, this is the, the denouement of, the comp, of, of this, this exercise, and I really would strongly endorse you to, well, strongly ask you to have a look at what we're doing and to talk to me over the weekend, and potentially I will be suggesting various ways that you might be able to help us. Um, this, that's the actual page. If you click on that video, you'll see Margaret and myself um, trying valiantly to sort of be on a video somewhat unsuccessfully. Um, so what news crisis? Well, this is, the, this is a graph which shows the news crisis. You'll see there that um, that's advertising revenue of newspapers in the States, but it's exactly the same everywhere. And that, that, um, that line is steepening in terms of its decline. And there's no real revenue response to that at all. And if you see there, it's been declining since, I don't know, the 90s. Um, and the news is the, new, the quality of the news that we are receiving as members of the public now is being produced maybe by one third the number of journalists as it was in, in 2000, pretty much in, throughout the throughout the world. And um, but we don't feel as though we've got a lack of information because we have all sorts of other news sources of information. But as Donald Rumsfeld famously said, the real problem in the world, the things that get you are the unknown unknowns. Like we can know the knowns, there's the known knowns and then there's the unknown knowns, but the unknown unknowns are the things that, that, that really screw up society. So, who will save us from Godzilla? The news crisis. This is the basic problem. Um, the advertising, I mean, what is Godzilla? I mean, this is, this is actually the, the point is Godzilla is who is Godzilla, what is the crisis? The, the challenge that we face comes from economic disruption of the advertising markets. And New Zealand publishers are particularly vulnerable because of scale. The markets which advertising are purchased in are global, and lots of um, programmatic advertising purchasing implementations are being managed out of Australia and Singapore. Um, and the bread and butter in online marketing is being done by robots, mainly. This here was announced yesterday, and it's a partnership between all three, all the major, well, four major New Zealand media companies, because TVNZ, Fairfax, NZME, and MediaWorks, three, three, um, and Bauer as well. Although I, I don't know if Bauer's included in this yet, but it, it's, yep, TVNZ's in there. And um, and the problem with um. The problem with robotic advertising purchasing is that it's essentially a model which is designed by the customer. And, and um, the only way to increase the value is to increase the, or to decrease the supply of, of advertising. And New Zealanders are now cap able to be advertised everywhere they are in the world. So you don't have to advertise on New Zealand websites. You can advertise on Facebook and Google and on The Guardian and basically anywhere. But also, in addition to that, every time you visit any website, the website records that you've been to it, and then when you come back to any, any, web, any, any, any one of these publishers, which is serving ads, they can then give you the ad for the website that you've been to in the past. So if, if you notice that you're just constantly seeing the same ads all the time, that's because of this, these systems. Um, 
And the problem is that the volume of advertising is just going through the roof. So these robots have taken over the, over the, over the, um, the markets, um, and they're disrupting the advertising agencies as much as they're disrupting the media companies. And I mean, essentially, the price just falls. The price of advertising has been falling continuously. Um, we were here when, it, when digital advertising sort of started in 2004, and um, it reached its peak in about 2007, and it's been in decline ever since. And last year, it fell off a cliff. And as a result of it falling off a cliff last year, we've seen some, some dramatic things. So MediaWorks is obviously slimming itself down at, down at, at pace and shutting down Campbell Live. Maori TV has been shedding journalists for slightly different reasons, I must admit. Um, Bauer Media has been working hard on reducing its editorial costs and trying to get people to, to sign sort of very, very unpleasant contracts. NBR has announced that it has an intention to focus on digital subscriptions as opposed to advertising. Both Fairfax and NZME have had redundancy rounds in the past six months involving respectively about 20% of their staff. And Fairfax announced that they were that they were disestablishing 180 positions and they were going to establish roughly the same number. However, I think about 60 or 70 of those are not fulfilled. And um, the reason that they're not fulfilled is that advertising, digital advertising and revenue in particular has fallen faster than expected and um, print advertising has been taking a big hit too. So for example, the Progressive Enterprises, which runs Countdown Supermarkets, um, is one of the biggest print advertisers in the country, especially newspaper advertisers, because they advertise all the, in all the little local newspapers. They decided to put all of their advertising online, to, to stop all print advertising, and that's $6 million out of the budgets of NZME and Fairfax. And in practical terms, that's about 150 journalists' jobs. Um, but they can't report it because it's not possible for the news media who sell confidence and strength and, and, and vitality to, to report on their own crises. So um, the level of knowledge of these, of these things is, is, is quite diminished. So that there, oh, that, that graph there was, was basically saying there's nine billion impressions. And I mean, I don't know, the number of impressions that are available is going through the roof. The only way that New Zealand publishers are gonna make any money out of the internet is if they operate as a cartel and they reduce dramatically the supply of, 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 of advertising. And if they ask the government and corporate organisations to place money deliberately within New Zealand publishers in order to support the publication of news. Um, but I, I can't see them doing that because that would be, a, be an admission of failure. Um, this, this is, um, we did a presentation on, on with, on content, so content, um, native content. So native content is essentially placed editorial. And um, you may notice that, that newspapers and online websites are full of content which sometimes you can't be so sure why it's there, whether it's actually a news article, whether it's, it's, it's a piece of propaganda, whether it's, a, whether it's an advert. Um, it, quite often it is an advert. Um, and I think that's probably slipping into print, pub, into print in ways that you're not, that we're not really recognising either. So, <clears throat> this is interesting. At the same time that we have this massive disruption in news, news, access to news is perceived to be a public right. So, Dr. Longhurst was talking about this earlier. It's philosophically perceived to be a public right, to, for, for, and it's and it's in the interests of society for it to happen. And the public believe that their access to news is a public right. However, it's not. There is no, there are no, I mean, there's rights to freedom of information, but there's no access to news. There's no funding for news. News companies are for-profit corporations, with the exception of TVNZ. TVNZ, like the other for-profit corporations, run, has a board, and their only objective, or their primary objective, let's say it, because it's not the only objective of TVNZ, but it's probably the only objective of the other, other, other publications, is to maximise shareholder value. And um, if maximising shareholder value involves deception and publishing propaganda and, and publishing stuff which is nonsense and publishing clickbait and sticking cats and, and sort of randomly in, in, in everywhere, um, then, then they will. But 
this, this, this is an action station survey. Three, three and a half thousand people, I think, um, were surveyed in this survey, and 99% <laughs> said that they believed that it was a right. If it's a right, we need to start legislating for it. We need to, we need to fund it, and we need to ensure that we have it. Um, there's, there's various ways that could be achieved, but we're not even having the debate at the moment. Um, they also believe, people also believe, overwhelmingly, 91%, that it's very, very important to have access information, to have a proper, to, to have democracy. Um, so it's not like it's, it's not like the people don't understand this. They, they know this very, very clearly. And this, this question was, was what do people, why do people feel, um, what do they think the causes of, what are they most concerned about? And they're most concerned about profit-driven and political interference in the news. Um, I'm just going to come back to that bit. Um, so, this is, um, this is a presentation that I gave to the Law Librarians Association a, a wee while ago. Um, and the central bit that I'm just going to talk about is just three points. So there's basically um, a three-stage plan for Operation Chrysalis, which is what we've been doing for the past um, past nine months, so since, since December. So, I mean, and the idea of setting up a Scoop Foundation actually started three years ago, and I mean, it's now, it's now complete. So as of September the 1st, we, um, we initiated the trust, the Scoop Foundation for Public Interest Journalism, Charitable Trust. We applied for charitable status, um, and we transferred all of the assets of Scoop the Scoop Publishing Company into that trust on the 16th of September, and um, and now and we launched a campaign called Take Back the News at the time, which um, which members and contributors. So essentially, it's trying to build a sort of collectivist base of people that can that can try to start working together to to build a new news infrastructure. Um, but there's three three principles underlying it. First of all. Oh. First of all, there's one of truth. So we knew that we knew that when we started this, that in, if, if we were going to set up a, a, a foundation for, for journalism, we're not going to get any money from anyone unless people start to understand what the problem is. Um, and that involves trying to get the media talking about the news crisis. And so in January, we launched um, this thing called the State of New Zealand News Media. And we're going to relaunch it shortly, and we'd like your help, because we'd, we're basically going to write a whole lot of op-eds about it. So we want as many people who, as who have a view about news and the news that they're consuming to give us their own views on the answers to some, some fairly simple questions about what they think about news and what they think the solutions ought to be. Um, we also ran this Save Campbell Live campaign, which um, sort of so did Action Station, who um, Laura's here from Action Station and will be talking tomorrow. Um, the Save Campbell Live um, public movement was twice as big as Red Peak. Um, and and um, just, I mean, it was, it was, it set the, set the, the um, I don't know, the, the social media universe of, of, of activism completely on fire. And for good reason, because, um, because John Campbell is a, Broadcaster who has a massive amount of empathy and and who genuinely helps people and also a massive amount of integrity. Um, he he rates um, twice as high in terms of favourability and trustworthiness as any other broadcaster, and yet he lost his job. And um, we have to wonder why. So part of the reason why I'm just going to I mean I'm gonna, just a slight diversion. The chief executives of the three major news companies in New Zealand are Simon Tong, who was formerly the CEO of Paymark, so that was an FPOS processing company. Jane Hastings, who's the, head, the CEO of NZME, was formerly the deputy CEO, I think, of, of Sky City Casino. And Mark Weldon was obviously the former CEO of NZX. None of them have a clue about anything related to media. So, I mean, we can't rely on them believing in ethics. And, and in a recent interview, Simon Tong, for example, said, came here, was rather surprised to find that there was a whole lot of people working here at Fairfax who believed that, or who felt that um, journalism was a calling, 
It was a vocation as opposed to a job. Well, journalism's been a vocation for probably at least a decade, maybe 15 years, because it hasn't been able to pay anybody properly. I was able to get paid the same amount of money in real terms, 50 cents a word, in 1988 as I would get now. Um, and it's just not possible in a million years to make a living out of it. And it was easier to sell copy back then. Um, so the second obstacle is trust. If the media, I mean the public, I mean this is one of the things which has struck me quite strongly after the last, last, over the last nine months, is that the level of antipathy that people feel towards the media is enormous. And it's not just the members of the public, politicians and business leaders, pretty much everybody feels like the media aren't doing their job properly, that they're, they're twisting the truth, that they're manipulating things in various ways, and, um, and don't particularly like us. And we're very thick-skinned, so we just sort of don't notice that. But, um, but it does make us like sitting ducks when it comes to, um, to trying to address problems like these ones that we're currently facing. So um, we were thinking, thinking about this, and we'd been, for, for, for some time, I mean, Scoop hasn't really been a business. I mean, we haven't been profit. We were profitable in 2007, I think was the last year that we were profitable. And, um, and we've, lo we've lost a reasonably large amount of money since 2007, and that's been generously provided by um, various people that, that I would, um, I would, I would I'm, that we're grateful to for, for their contribution, um, and, and a fairly substantial amount of money from my family. Um, so it doesn't make a lot of sense to be a business on the one hand, but also one of the reasons people don't trust media companies is that they, they, when they think media companies, they see Rupert Murdoch, they see Conrad Black, they see, I don't know, um, John Ailes. There's, media companies are just full of manipulating, powerful, lying bastards, really. Um, and so, that, and that is the, that is the, that is the positioning of news media organisations. Now, the exception to that, of course, is The Guardian, which is owned by a charitable trust. And, um, and hence, the structure of the Scoop Foundation is essentially that of the, the Scott Trust. Although the Scott Trust was founded with large amounts of money, and, and the Scoop Foundation is founded with no money at all. Um, which, is, which comes to the third point, sustainability. So, in order for us to, um, to try to continue to do what we're doing, we had to have a solution to the, pro pro to the problem of sustainability. And um, we actually had this idea of ethical paywalls that we've introduced. I'm not sure if, if has anybody, how, how many people here are familiar with, with this, this change that we've made? Okay, so, so briefly, <laughs> well, that's, that's about half of you, that's, quite, that's pretty good, that's pretty impressive. Um, so basically, um, it's like taking Creative Commons but making it enforceable. So what we've said to corporate organisations and to business organisations that use us, well, we've changed our terms and conditions of use. And our terms and conditions of use state that if you use us commercially, and that means reading us or accessing us, accessing us for work, or so if you if you routinely um, find yourself on Scoop to do fact-checking, to spell people's names, or to look up companies, or so forth, um, then you need to pay us. And we've got a sliding scale which starts at $400 a year for organisations which have less than 20 people, um, and it ranges up to about $4,000 for organisations which are, are substantially over 4,000 people. So Auckland Council, for example, is going to probably pay us $5,000 a year to read Scoop. Um, Auckland Council is also the biggest contributor of, of press releases of any particular organisation to us, so that seems entirely fair. Um, the, um, we don't, we're, not going to pub, we're not going to charge for the publishing, of, the publishing of press releases because A, we want to have editorial control over what press releases we publish, 
And second, and, and that means we don't want to be under any obligation to edit them or delete them or correct them if, 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 if asked to. That's not, not to say that we won't and we don't do so from time to time, but if somebody wants to try and remove or scrub the record of, of what they're saying, then we're not, we don't participate in that. Um, and it's all, but it's also because that's where the main value is. I mean, the, the fundamental problem that Scoop has is that the vast value that it gives to, to, to the community that it, that it serves is done through things that it provides for free. So firstly, the publishing, publication of press releases, and secondly, people just reading the website. So when we try to sell people things like advertising, we're trying to sell advertising against I don't know, these global multinational corporations. When we're trying to sell media monitoring services, again, we're trying to sell them versus big multinational corporations with very, very high spec technology and so forth. So, um, and unless there's some, unless there's some reason that people have to pay us, um, they don't. So, we've introduced this, and people have started paying us now. The task that we set out at the beginning of the year, I, I, the, when we started in Operation Chrysalis in December, basically had a series of, um, of, of stop points. If, if it, and if at any point that we'd failed, we would have had to shut down our commercial operations. We basically had to rebuild the driving engine of a train whilst it was growing along and turning it into a new form of propulsion. So, I don't know, replacing a steam engine with an, ele with an electric engine on a plane which is going along whilst we're running out of fuel. <coughs> um, and remarkably, we seem to succeed in doing that. So, in May we launched this, and um, we now have MFAT, Parliament, MB, Department of Internal Affairs, um, State Services Commission, um, Treasury has recently agreed to, um, to become a subscriber. Uh, who else? Um, AUT University, Russell McVeigh, DLA Piper, Bell Gully, a bunch of law firms. Um, so, and 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 increasingly recently, a bunch of um, of of PR firms. So, and I mean, it's the first time in Scoop's history that we've had a product which is scalable and which we can actually sell. I mean, we've I mean, this this past couple of weeks. We've, we've taken on a new salesperson, um, they make appointments, they ring people up, and then they just make sales, and they make sales reasonably quickly. Now, this is, this is what the internet business is supposed to be like. And the justification for it, and when the reason that we're, we're succeeding, is because Scoop is, so, is relied upon by so many people in this country. So, I mean, the fact that we've been doing this for 16 years means that we have more information which is reliable and accurate about the New Zealand news environment in our database, which is accessible by Google, than any other publisher. Now, what we're doing is perfectly able to be done by Fairfax, NZME, MediaWorks, and TVNZ, and even Radio New Zealand. They could just change their terms and conditions of use and they could start charging businesses to, to pay them to, to, re, to listen to the radio. I can't see any reason why that wouldn't be the case. Now, in the case of public broadcasters, there's probably some kind of a double, double, um, double dipping sort of effect that might 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 come into play. Um, but that's not the case um, for their website content, and it's not the, say, the case for because they're not funded for their website content. In the case of Radio New Zealand, um, so there's there's a but there's been so far since we've we've done this, there's been a completely resounding silence from the other media companies about it. Um, so this is the scoop, the scoop company. There's a, there's a sort of like a, um, there's a PDF that you can read, which explains the um, foundation, and I'm quite happy to explain how the foundation works. And essentially, there's a, there's a foundation which is the trustees, me and Margaret, and then there's a separate um, publishing company, and it, it, it's designed, the structure is designed to protect the organisation from editorial interference and to protect the organisation from from editorial and commercial interference. Um, and and that, um, that concludes um, the formal bit. So, thank you.